Good morning. Whether here in person or watching on the internet, welcome to Sunday morning worship at North Springfield Church this fourth Sunday of Lent. If you are here in person, please be sure your phone is silenced. Sunday worship returns to the sanctuary next Sunday, and judging by this weekend's weather, we guess right keeping services here in the social hall today. But next week, it's back to the other building as we look forward to Palm Sunday and Easter. Our palm branches are ordered, but we need your help getting Easter lilies. Your bulletin this morning has an order blank for our beautiful flowers on Easter Sunday. Orders and payments are due by April 4th. One great hour of sharing special offering will be the next Sunday, April 10th and copies of our spring quarterly devotional booklet these days are are still available at the back desk uh, another note here uh, we are going to bring back easter breakfast uh, here in lieu of fellowship on easter morning uh, there'll be no fellowship after services but we do want to do a little easter breakfast and details will follow on that uh, in the coming weeks prior to. Uh, I know that Patty has an announcement concerning women's Bible study, and Jan also has one. I just want to uh, uh, thank Joan for calling everybody when I was sick on Thursday and couldn't uh, be at Bible study. I know it was very disappointing. It was disappointing to everybody involved, but it was disappointing to me too. Uh, what we'll do is, um, uh, I know in your bulletin it says our next lesson is Ruth, but actually our next lesson will be Rahab. I'm not going to try to, to reschedule it during the month because people have certain weeks of the month that they do things and I don't want to leave anybody out. So so we'll do uh, Rahab next um, next month and since this month was supposed to be North Springfield and it's already on Goodyear Heights calendar for next month, we'll go into Goodyear Heights uh, for that next Bible study. Once again, um, you know, I don't know. I haven't been sick in like three years, so it was like, what? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I, I appreciate um, all of your thoughts and prayers, and I do feel better. Um, I'm not 100%, as you'll probably find out, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. So thank you. What if these were the days when Jesus was living with us? What if this were the moment God chose to connect? Where would we find Jesus? Here in our congregation? Look around. Or in our neighborhoods? Perhaps Jesus would be among people classified as essential, who might struggle to feed their own families while ensuring food makes it to others' tables. Perhaps Jesus would be working in a neighborhood, mostly ignored by governments and industry, except when there were resources to be exploited or removed. Perhaps Jesus lives in any of the places, so impoverished in a world of plenty that help and hope seem like illusions. Or perhaps locked away, drowned out, or disregarded so far from us that we never even know our Savior's name. What if this is the time? What if this is the place? Our faith proclaims that God connects in each of those places and in each person bearing God's image. Our faith proclaims that God is among us and that Jesus can be found among those most precious to God, those neighbors experiencing hunger, oppression, or lack even now, even among us. One great hour of sharing connects us with people coming together to respond to the needs in their neighborhoods. It is the largest way Presbyterians connect with one another and unite with congregations in every corner of the church and with partners all over the world. We connect in order to grow together while offering support that addresses shared needs in a particular context. With God and one another, we connect the story of Jesus who lived, healed, and preached among those who had least during his earthly ministry through ministries that seek healing and wholeness in our world today. One great hour of sharing connects us to proclaim that Christ is here. God is with us. Jesus is among those who have least, those who hunger and thirst, 
those who are sick or alone with their neighbors, and those seeking righteousness and justice for all and with all of those who are in need. Connect us with our need, connect us with our offerings, connect us through the gift of your love and your love for all you have created. Amen. As we continue to keep uh, Ukraine in our um, prayers, let us pray this morning. Loving God, we pray for the people of Ukraine, for all those suffering or afraid that you will be close to them and protect them. We pray for world leaders for compassion, strength, and wisdom to guide their choices. We pray for the world that in this moment of crisis, we may reach out in solidarity to our brothers and sisters in need. May we walk in your ways so that peace and justice become a reality for the people of Ukraine and for all the world. Amen. As we join now for the call to worship, please stand if you choose to do so. In Jesus Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. This newness is from God who has reconciled us through Jesus Christ. God has made everything new, including us. With thanksgiving, let us praise and worship God. Welcoming God, we have gathered together so that you may teach us the way we should go. Remind us once again that in Jesus Christ, everything has become new. For far too long, we have been trying to keep things the way they have always been. Old habits die hard. Difficult situations linger. We stubbornly follow our own plans. Speak to us again today of your new creation. Help us to see your promised newness. Open our eyes to its presence in our lives and in our church. Then call us forth to claim and live into this newness, that we may be healed and made whole. Amen. Amen. to the font to remember that the font connects our confession of sin with the grace and cleansing of our baptism and with our baptismal call every day to new life in Christ. We know our faults, the way we have treated others, our alienation from God, 
our unwillingness to be faithful people. Let us not hide our sins or remain silent, but confess them to the one who surrounds us with steadfast love. O oh God, we will not try to hide from you the wrong we have done or the good we have neglected. You know our transgressions. You have observed our self-righteousness, our self-centeredness, our self-absorption. We are claiming too lightly the label Christian, for often we cut ourselves off from you and from your people. At times our rebellion leaves us feeling alone and friendless. Holy One, we are not worthy to be called your children. Grant us, we pray, your forgiveness and a renewed sense of who you intend for us to be and to become. Let us take this time of silence for personal reflection and confession. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As a parent welcomes home a wayward child, so God embraces all who return in true repentance. Happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom God assigns no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. We rejoice that God has brought us back to life and granted us forgiveness in Christ. Thanks be to God. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please turn to one another with signs of peace and reconciliation, saying, the peace of Christ be with you. For those of you at home, the peace of Christ be with you. minds and hearts to the recreating power of your word that we may see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as a foretaste of your new creation Amen. 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 hear these words from the Old Testament uh, the book from Joshua the Lord said to Joshua today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt and so that place is called Gilgal to this day while the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Cana that year. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in a responsive reading of Psalm 32, which is written in your bulletin. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and whose spirit while I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. 
Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Hear these words from Corinthians, a portion of Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world, world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you. That was beautiful and very touching. Thank you, choir. <clears throat> A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Let us listen for what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who, was devour, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. <clears throat> then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we come longing to hear your voice speaking to us across all time. So silence within us any voice but your own, that we may stand under your word until we come to understand it. Amen. <coughs> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that just isn't true, is it? We know that words, they have great power, don't they? It matters what other people think of us. We like to think that growing up and becoming mature means that we've become self-confident, that we know who we are that we've become a self-differentiated adult, immune to the criticism of others. But that simply isn't true. And unless we move to some deserted island somewhere, we can never 
escape the opinions, the criticisms, and the evaluations of others. In a job, a person's performance is always graded and evaluated, praised or criticized, rewarded or penalized. Likewise, in our everyday life, we can never escape forming opinions and making evaluations of others. We are constantly judging others on the basis of gender or race, age, appearance, economic status, and so on and so on. At the heart of the way people evaluate one another is keeping score. And at the heart of that scorekeeping is our need to score points for ourselves. According to the human point of view, such scorekeeping in inevitably makes winners and losers. And that's the downside of it all. Some people are more beautiful and popular than others. Some are smarter, faster, taller, stronger than others. Some come in first, and some just go home. None of us wants to lose or come in second or be left behind because someone else is better. We all want to know that we matter, that we count, that we're loved, that we're right. There's no escaping that need. It's what makes us human. And so we draw our line in the sand. We divide the world into those who are for us and those who are against us. And that brings me to mind uh, an old joke. The joke goes, what's the difference between God and Mr. Jones? Well, God never acts like he thinks he's Mr. Jones. And that raises the most important question of all, the God question. What does God think of us? Some of us just, just avoid that question altogether. We just brush God off. Even though we might show up in church, even though we might say that we believe in God, we live most of our lives as if God doesn't really exist. Or we live as if God's opinion of us really doesn't matter. We live with this huge disconnect between Sunday morning and the rest of the week. But do we honestly think that God is going to let us brush him off and let us go and live our lives as if God didn't exist? Of course not. The truth of the matter is that God is there with us seven days a week. There's no place in this universe where we can hide from God's scrutiny. It's tough enough to measure up to the human point of view but measuring up to God's point of view, that seems impossible. And this is the dilemma that lies behind Paul's words to the Corinthians in today's epistle reading. The people in the Corinthian congregation were splintered and divided because they all seemed to care, because all of what they seemed to care about was living according to the human point of view. All they could do was pass judgment on one another. All they could do was divide their congregation into those who were on their side or not on their side, into those who were winners and those who were losers. Some spiritual gifts were better than others. Some were fans of one preacher instead of another. Some had more money than others. Some were smarter than others. The scorekeeping went on and on and on hopelessly dividing the congregation into a bunch of warring factions. It had made their lives miserable. Miserable. But all is not lost, because at the heart of today's lesson is Paul's appeal to regard one another according to a new point of view. He reminds them that it's possible to live their lives differently because of what God has already done for them in Christ. They don't have to always be keeping score, counting up other people's sins, measuring accomplishments, both theirs and others, as they shamelessly pursue their own success. 
They no longer need to tear up their congregation <clears throat> with one mean-spirited, slanderous conversation after another. All of that is no longer necessary. They no longer have to build themselves up at the expense of others because they are a new creation. They're part of a new world, a new way of life, marked not by the scorekeeping of the human point of view or n even the scorekeeping of God's own judgment. God, in his grace and mercy, has decided to end it all and make a new world, a new creation. At the heart of that new creation is Christ and what God has done in Christ. Paul describes that marvelous action of God as reconciliation. Where there previously had been division and conflict, now there is unity and peace. Where previously there had been competitors and enemies, there are now companions and friends. And the amazing thing about this new creation is that God so loved the world, even those who were his enemies, that God decided to end the conflict. God reconciled God's self to us through Christ. In this season of Lent, as we make our journey to Jerusalem, to Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Monday Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter, we're reminded of Christ's soul mission and purpose. At the heart of Christ's mission is the bold declaration, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. What was it about the kingdom that would cause us to repent, to so change our lives that we would be an utterly new creation, no longer regarding the world from a human point of view? Well, watch Jesus. See how he treats others. Listen to what he says. And soon it becomes very clear that he's not viewing this world according to a human point of view. Instead of judging sinners, he's the friend of sinners. He eats and drinks with outcasts. He embraces those who seem to be utter failures and losers. He takes upon himself everything that's wrong and sick in this world. And he bears it all, knowingly and willingly. It is the beginning of a whole new world, of what can only be called a new creation. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. That means that we no longer look at the world from a human point of view. We look at it from the way God looks at it in Christ. The pages of the New Testament are filled with examples of what that new creation looks like. A man born blind who was thought of as nothing more than a, a beggar, an outcast, a, a sinner, condemned to live his life off the generosity of others. Jesus sees him in a totally different way. He sees him the way God sees him. Jesus loves him. He gives him his sight and as the blind man opens his eyes to see for the first time and looks at Jesus, see for the very first time and he looks at Jesus, he sees the most perfect example of God in a human being. A son demands his inheritance, leaves his father and wastes it all and decadent living. From a human point of view, he deserves to be on the street begging for crumbs. He deserves to eat pig food. In desperation, he decides to return home, hoping that his father might be willing to accept him as a slave. From a human point of view, that's really all he could hope for. But his father doesn't look at him from a human point of view. He looks at him from God's point of view. 
in Christ and welcomes him home with a new robe on his back, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and a fatted calf for dinner. From the cross, Jesus looks down at his enemies who had brutally abused and ridiculed him. A crown of thorns had cut into his forehead. His back had been made raw from vicious beatings. His hands had been pierced by nails. According to a human point of view, those who had inflicted this suffering and pain on him deserved his disdain, deserved his hatred. But Jesus didn't look at them like that. Instead, he looked at them through the eyes of the kingdom of God. And when he did, he could only see people crushed by the weight of their own hatred. This was no time for revenge. This was time for reconciliation. And so Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I can't imagine a better person to teach about reconciliation than one who lived the struggle of trying to welcome back a whole country that was lost, South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He writes in the book of forgiving, a person is a person through other person. None of us comes into the world fully formed. We would not know how to think or walk or speak or behave as human beings unless we learned it from other human beings. We need other human beings in order to be human. I am because other people are. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old is passed away. See, everything has become new. With this new point of view, we can live our lives no longer keeping score, no longer counting people's sins against them, no longer dividing the world into winners and losers. We, like Christ, can turn the other cheek, forgive our enemies, welcome home the prodigals, and welcome the world. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us stand and say what we believe using the affirmation of faith, which is in your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. I believe God, the Father Almighty,
we receive it for prayer. Gathered by the Spirit, let us return to the Lord our God and pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Forgiving God, gather all who have wandered from you. Bless your church, reconcile us to you, and lead us to be ambassadors of your love. Deliver us from greed, teach us to be obedient to your will, and lead us to seek out the lost and all who have strayed from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant to all people a share in the abundance and beauty of your creation. Bless those who have too little and trouble the hearts of those with too much that they would generously share that which you have gifted them. Teach us to preserve and protect the world you have entrusted to our care. May we all share wisely its resources and conserve its riches for our children's children. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain those who rule the nations with your presence and guide them in the ways of peace and justice. Bless the leaders and lawmakers of all nations. Instill in their hearts a spirit of compassion and mercy and a desire to put aside their own selfish interests in pursuit of what is good for the people whom they govern and for all people of the world. We ask your comfort and protection upon those people and nations in the midst of terrorism or war, especially the people of Ukraine who are living in the fear of what the next minute, hour, day might bring. Change the hearts of those set on violence and aggression and fill them with the wisdom to find paths of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bring healing to those who are addicted, hope to those who despair, and comfort to all who grieve that they may know your love. Grant wholeness to all those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit, especially those on the prayer list of North Springfield Church, for Rick Bowman, and for all those that we now name in our hearts, either silently or aloud. Elaine Gray, Alicia Zahas, Pastor Patty, Jason McKenzie, Gail Carpenter's family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are lost, for those who are separated from the love of God, friends, or family, and for those who have never known such love, that they may come to know the joy of love's embrace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, you have commanded us to pray, and you promise to hear us. Hear the prayers of your people this day for the sake of your world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Knowing that all we have comes from you, as people of the new creation, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
gracious God. Bless now our intentions and our offerings. Bless now our lives and our commitments. By your Spirit, reform our lives into one who is worthy of the task you place before us. In Jesus' name. now and stay near to God, speaking to and for God during the week that lies ahead. Be ambassadors of Christ every day by welcoming, not judging, our sisters and brothers. And know that the spirits of love and compassion will be with you as you share with others the joy of God's goodness, mercy, and love. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day, your whole life long. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen.